This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings and welcome to another installment of the show. I've got a conversation with Gary Holt from Exodus and Slayer to share with you. The catalyst for the conversation is due to the launch of a new album from Exodus. It is titled Persona Non Grata and it'll see light of day via Nuclear Blast on November 19, 2021. So of course we talk all about the album, a bit of Slayer, and we deep dive into significant aspects of Gary's extraordinary career. Before we get to the conversation though, let's have a listen to a slither of a tune from Persona Non Grata. This one's called Clickbait. Once it's finished, we'll jump right into the chat. Hey, how you doing? Gary, lovely to last talk to one, you. The last, one, the last one went a little bit over. You're a popular man, Gary, I've got to say. So <laughs> I can understand these things. You know, how have the uh, the Zoomers, as we've got to call them these days, they're not phoners anymore, mate, but how have the Zoomers, Zoomers been going? Yeah, Zoomers, I guess we call them. Yeah, they've been treating you well, though. I mean, people are people are obviously stoked to talk to you, mate, but overall, do you, you're feeling the buzz? Yeah, yeah, everybody, you know, Everybody loves the fucking album. It's you know that's what you hope for. At the same time, you write records for yourself. You know, mm. we always just want our, us to be happy. If other people like it, then it's like a bonus win. You know, and everybody seems to be like fucking over the moon about this record. Yeah, they do. Yeah, which is kind of the the premise of my first question for you, which is that it's a bit of a monologue, but there is a question at the end. So bear with me here, okay? So. Look, you were there at the very beginning of the emergence of thrash and speed metal, and Exodus has long been the speed metal fans' band of choice, if you know what I'm saying. Fuck the critics, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, Whether it be timing, personnel changes, music industry apathy, or what have you, there is a sense, I feel, as though that Exodus has never been quite given the due that you so richly deserve. Now, there are a few bands that are finding critical acclaim later in their careers. And Testament's a pretty good example of that. But now here you are, and the internet is just buzzing to the point we just made. Um, Your interviews are lead articles on clickbait websites, which is ironic, (laughs) given we'll talk about the (laughs) the song title of uh, the title. Yeah, but here you are. I mean, you're a lead article, you know, but do do you feel... They were the inspiration, you know, like... uh... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but, they absolutely inspired it. But you, you do you feel like as though the buzz surrounding this album is just a bit different to reactions to previous albums? Um, maybe you know, like I mean, not you know, when it comes to Exodus, I'm my biggest fan. You know, like I love these records. You know, I, I, Exhibit A and Exhibit B are like to me, they're masterpieces of like progressive modern thrash it's like you know it's like rush meets exodus you know Mm. and i love that you know but every album is what it is you know we never like set out to like change anything we just what we write is what we write where we're feeling musically and creatively is what comes up this album you know maybe it's a little different you know it's been seven years you know we've been Mm. through a pandemic the end of slayer so maybe people you know a little the buzz is a little different, you know, that um, we're finally putting this album out and we worked our asses off on this record, you know, mm-hmm. and then end, the end result is, uh, you know, at least my opinion, the album's a monster front to back. There's not a weak moment to be found. And, and I hope everybody feels the same. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm biased, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're justifiably proud of the body of work that you've, you've contributed to metal. And uh, look, Nuclear Blast, they have shared three songs with me, okay? So I haven't listened to the entire album yet. I've been given the three songs, though. So The Years of Death and Dying, Clickbait, that's what I was referring to up top there, and uh, perhaps a tune with the song title of the year, Gotta Love This, The Beatings Will Continue Until Morale Improves. And I notice you've got a Marine Corps <laughs> uh, flag up there behind you. So I, I love the way you've sort of linked, linked 
that uh, that attitude of being tough, you know, which links in with your guitar playing. But look, I think the most en- the most immediate aspect is that you've blended melody across these three cuts. Your your very uh, unique and precision riffing, riffing and choice arrangements. I love the arrangements this time around as well, in a manner which is identifiably Exodus. But I do feel like as though there's some new stuff in there too, because it gives you a platform from here to see what the to do something a bit different potentially on some of the uh, some material that you conjure on albums moving forward. With everything that was going on in Slayer, did you finally get around to writing the album after the Repentless cycle was finished and the, the Slayer, Slayer's final shows were done? Or have you been writing for Exodus constantly since Blood In, Blood Out? I mean, I'm constantly writing, you know, like, uh, you know, constantly writing riffs. I'll record them on my phone backstage without an app. I'll just put it up next to the strings and try to, you know, decipher the plinking later. You know, I'll, I've written riffs down in notate in just notes hmm. when I didn't have a guitar around, you know, like I've got an idea and like, so I'll just go into my notes and, and uh, tab it out, so to speak. When people who have asked and they've heard the songs, this is great. You know, are these like, you know, the the songs most indicative of the record? I tell them, no, absolutely not. You know, like we chose the beatings for a single because it's the shortest song. Tom Hunting battling cancer. We love the song. We love them all. Mm. And um, but, you know, we achieved my longstanding goal of doing a music video that I don't have to be in because I hate making <laughs> music videos. It's the one thing I can't stand doing. You know, they expect you to stand there and headbang for like fucking nine hours straight. Yeah. And uh, and then we're just choosing our songs. I mean, to me, when people hear the title track, that's the the first thing they're going to hear on the album. It's, it's a fucking baseball bat to the head. It's insane. It's the mm. second longest song on the album. You know, it's the longest album opener we ever done. And uh, I can't pick a song, you know, that any one of them could have been these lyric videos, you know. Two were long, you know, there's two long songs, so we didn't choose those because, you know, making someone like do a lot more work. And um, but, you know, I want people to hear this whole damn thing. It's impossible to pick what are the standout tracks. Mm. I mean, people are going to hear the record and some people might like one of the three that we've released the best. Other people are going to like fucking fuck me. I had no idea. Like Lunatic Liar Lord is just this epic of just brutality and doom and it's thrash metal and then just slow, just crushing, ominous moods and really, really cool stuff. I've always loved your guitar playing, I've got to say. Ever since I heard Toxic Waltz as a a young fella back in the day, a song that really kicked it off for so many of us. I'm 43, so not certainly wasn't there at the beginning. I was only four or five or whatever when you guys started. But uh, my early teenage years, hearing Toxic Waltz and that that just that down picking technique that you've got. So this time around, did you deploy any techniques that were new for this album? Not really. I mean, you know, the the big thing for me is, um, you know, we kind of went back to. Uh, yeah, I went back to, you know, recording with Marshalls, you know, like I did the last time with my Kemper, you know, because, mm. you know, we didn't have the room to mic things up. And in other albums past, we tend to record on, you know, like once the drums are done, we're recording on like, you know, a, a, a small version of Pro Tools, you know, usually the ones with like two inputs of, at a time available, you know, two tracks. And um and this time, you know, we had like a massive Pro Tools rig set up. So you know, I was able to like mic up everything and anything I wanted, you know. And we had so many different mics up, you know, experimenting and stuff and just Marshall amps, you know, Jubilee reissue and a uh, couple of pedals boost in the front and um, two two cabs loaded with different Celestians and and just went went, went for it like old school style, you know, just. And to me, the biggest joy in recording is getting guitar tone. Yeah, I missed that on the last album because, you know, I have my profile, which is of my modded Marshall and you just plugged it in and went, you know, I missed that quest for tone. You know, that's the best thing about doing an album and it gets you very excited. Mm. It does. Yeah. You, you've always had a tone that felt like as though it was going to jump out of the speakers and rip your head off. And, and that's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but that comes down to your right hand technique. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, it's all in the right hand. I mean, a lot of people think my tone is 
very high gainy, but it's not. I just play really hard and it's kind of like squeezing it out of the guitar. Like other people play my rig and it doesn't sound at all the same. Now, I've heard that with um, the people that have picked up Les Claypool's bass or Steve Harris's bass. And they go to play and say, hang on a sec, why don't I sound like me? Why don't I sound like you? Because it's all in this. Different hands. Yeah, different yeah, hands. Exactly. Yeah. Now, it's a topic-rich environment these days for a metal band. God knows with everything going on, it's a, a Biden presidency, Afghanistan. God knows what else we could talk about. But what subjects and topics were addressed uh, through the album's lyrics this time around? You know, what? one thing we we did on this album is we never wanted to be too obvious what we were talking about. I prefer subtlety. You know, um, the one topic that was off limits was a an obvious blatant song about the pandemic, because mm. I knew that by the time the song come out, there'll probably be like 100 songs, 100 albums titled pandemic or whatever. And uh, I just didn't want to be obvious. So, you know, we tried to like you know, be a little more sly and subtle about it. Like the beatings will continue was, you know, inspired watching these riots, you know, which people are rioting over legitimate concerns and, um, and they're being beaten. And I was like, what is the end game here on the Billy club to the head to like, make them like behave, you know, <laughs> make them like feel better about this current system situation. It's doing the exact opposite. So, and uh, that's kind of where the inspiration to the, for that came. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody listening from Melbourne can probably relate to that. I don't know whether you've seen the images that are being beamed out of that city at the moment, but to your point, legitimate protests against lockdowns are being met with batons of the bloody head. First time I've yeah, seen it and, out of Australia. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And obviously in every riot in America was absolutely no different in every legitimate riot. There's a gang of fucking idiots that like use it as an opportunity to loot and steal and just fuck shit up, you know? And yeah, you know, the conservative in me in me comes out in those moments and like, you got to put these fucking people down, you know, they won't yeah. do it again, but you know, you can't just start firing tear gas into people standing there holding a sign, you know, voicing their, you know, constitutional right to gather, you know, and assemble. Yeah. Well, they're trying to outlaw protesting. Uh, in Melbourne, I understand, or the state of Victoria. That's insane. Yeah. It's it's nuts. Well, it's totalitarianism, and it's, but I think we're going yeah. through that time at the moment. We've got a lot of soft men that have led to hard times, uh, unfortunately, and we're seeing that in, in certain instances. But uh, look, back to the album, I understand that you recorded Persona Non Grata as bushfires raged around you. So can you tell me about that? Uh, yeah, we're up at Tom's house you know, last year. There was... You know, within like 20 miles, there was some major, massive, like record level, like California fires going on like every year. And uh, we were Tom Honey was out there drumming in in conditions. You're not even supposed to leave the house. You know, mm. the air quality index was so bad. We shouldn't have been in town, you know, but we were just out there. Our engineer, Steve Lagutti, is outside smoking a cigarette and the shit you know, like mm. and uh it was it was bad, you know, but uh, we just kept working. You know, fires weren't a threat to us. Just the smoke was horrible. Yeah, I can imagine. We're used to it, as you know. Uh, the summers here are virtually just the whole air is just filled with eucalypt. The smell of eucalypt on fire. Yeah, and I moved. I moved in a wildfire zone just last December, and I've already had my first like you know scare. Mm. I never got like a never received them. Any evacuated notice at all, but I was loading my car up. <laughs> I was like not taking any chances. It was a good, it was a good uh, fire drill for me. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to pick up your favorite guitars and all that sort of stuff, I suppose, haven't you? Yeah. I had too many guitars in the house. I realized that though. You know, I don't need that many around. Some were just piled in cases, so I, I got the excess shit out of here and mm. some other re irreplaceable memorabilia is now in a safe location. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Now, now, Persona Non Grata is Zetro's second album since his return on Bloody and Blood Out in 2014. Look, I've got to say, I think you picked beautifully, and probably that's not the right word. You did a killer job when you selected Rob Dukes uh, to join the band, because I must say the albums that you did with him are among some of my personal favourites. But Me I think too. I love those albums as much as anything we've ever done. 
yeah, yeah, he's he's such a great he's such a great singer and front man. He's he's a bit different to everybody else, but my gosh, he did such a great job and you did such a great job selecting him. But I feel like as though Zetro is the custom built Exodus front man uh, in the absence of Paul. Now, how has your relationship with Zetro evolved this time around? This is his second stint. Well, Zetro and I now are close friends, you know, and through the 80s and all that. I don't honestly know if I could say that, you know, mm. he came from a different region in Northern California where people think differently than they did from us. We were like East Bay guys, you know, from San Pablo, Richmond, Berkeley. And, um, you know, it's almost, you know, even though we're like a half an hour drive away, it's a culture difference. It certainly was. and. um and, you know, he was probably also unfairly like uh, held to a Paul Bailoff standard his whole time in the band. Mm. And uh, but now over all the years, we've learned to communicate. You know, we don't like go and whine to management about each other. We'll whine to each other. But uh, we don't even find the need to do that. We have a good time. We hang out. We talk. And um, and he's my friend. And it's awesome. You know, but we've gotten older and gotten wiser and learned some lessons, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Are you mates with Rob these days? I'm sorry. Are you mates with Rob these days, Rob Dukes? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I played a solo on the new Generation Kill, and you know, when he's got a video out, I post it on my Instagram, and you know, he'll shoot me messages from time to time. He keeps talking about taking a motorcycle trip up this way and come spend a few days at the house here in the hills, and uh, mm. I hope he does it. You know, everybody that's ever been in Exodus. Even if it's not like that initially, we all end up friends. You know, and um. Mm. And they're all welcome to come jam and hang out and and uh, and get up on stage anytime. You know, Rick Hunel just played two shows jamming with us. And um, yeah, nice. And we like it that way. You know, we like maintaining uh, the family atmosphere around this band. It's great for the fans, but also life's too short, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm 57 years old. You know, I can't go around carrying grudges. You know, my whole life. Did you think you'd still be doing this at 57 years of age if you could even have that thought back in the day? (laughs) Oh, fuck no. I remember when 30 sounded so old. Yeah, same. (laughs) Like, you're washed up if you're a 30-year-old headbanger. I'm 57, but I still headbang. Yeah. It's the only thing I know how to do, right? You just got to take a lot of Panadol or ibuprofen with you for the next day, I suppose. Haven't you? Absolutely. My, you know, I'm really healthy these days, except for my joints. You know, I have problems with the heel of my feet. You know, you know, Achilles tendonitis. My mm. knees are fucked. My elbows have, you know, that's been a whole issue about even playing guitar. But they're getting better. And uh, but my neck and my shoulders are good. My back is fucked up too. So mm. you know, I'm like a car with a new motor and really bad suspension <laughs> and bald tires, you know, <laughs> and you're, no brakes. You're a 67 Mustang. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm a retro, retro mod, you know. Yeah, retro mod. I love them. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah. pricey, but yeah, bloody I'm, hell, that's I'm like an old Mustang. They've dropped an LS engine in it, but they haven't upgraded nice. the rest of it yet. Love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a car head, you see, so I love that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I love the shit. Yeah, what, what do you drive? What's your main drive? A uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee. Same. Yeah, which, what year? Uh, 2011. I've got an 06. I've got a WK, the uh, 6.1 yeah, liter. Got, yeah. yeah, I got the Hemi in it. My wife has the nice car, though. She's got the 2011 Ford Explorer ST. Nice. Yeah, nice. It's fucking fast. You know, it, it doesn't sound like mine, though. You know, I mean, it's faster than mine, twin turbocharged V6, mm. but it doesn't rumble. No, nah, Hemis are... It's Hemis got the 20-inch rims on it, and it's fucking fully loaded. And at night, the rearview mirrors project the red ST logo on the ground. It's pretty fancy. Ford do pretty a good bad. job with that detail, don't they? Yeah, but I don't even drive it when they're both sitting there. I jump in mine. The interior is all old and fucked up, and you know I throw firewood in the back, and I don't worry about it being dirty. You know. No, me neither. I mean, I'm a muso too. I play covers, so yeah, mine's banged up in the back from all of the uh, cases and um, amps and all of that sort of stuff. Probably yours too. I take it. Yeah, yeah. I used to baby it and take care of it, and now I barely ever wash it. You know, I mean, it's in good shape. You know, but. Uh, it's not like I'm getting it waxed all the time anymore. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Yeah. Now, t- Tom Hunting, um, I know there's a lot of information on the web out there about him uh, and his battle with counter cancer, but I-, I couldn't see whether or not this point had been addressed. Um, 
is he likely to join the band on tour whenever the touring starts? Oh, absolutely. 100%. It's a done deal. I mean, he'd, he'd be able to do it now if the tour hadn't been postponed. He just, we just played our first show back last week and it was an emotional triumph. It was epic and he destroyed it, you know, but um, mm. this does give him a little more time to get his core strength back and stuff. But, you know, his tempo was blazing fast. He pummeled the drums. It was, it was epic. You know, it was awesome. Yeah, I know the fans are chuffed that that's happening. Um, not that Mr. Tempesta does a bad job at all because he's a killer drummer, but, uh, yeah, you, you love to see those original members in the band. Now, Tom's the heart and soul of this band. Mm. Okay, killer, yeah. Now, look, I know I speak for myself uh, when I say there was only one man that could honour Jeff Hanneman, and excuse me for using the third person here, but I happen to be speaking to him. Now, I'm sure Slayer comes up every other uh, interview, so I'll try and keep it brief for you because we're here to talk about Exodus. But uh, what did you enjoy most about playing those final shows with Slayer? You know, um, just uh, the amount of people that came out to see it, you know, like, you know, especially the amount of people who flew in for the final two shows was epic. And it was emotional. You know, tears were shed while playing Angel of Death. And who had ever thought that would happen, right? Mm. Who plays Angel of Death and like trying to like keep the tears at bay, you know, for the last fucking time. But um, it was an awesome, awesome moving thing and um, an amazing part of my life. Yeah, it's it's such a strange thing, isn't it, to think that Slayer isn't around? Uh, something that had yeah, been, it is. It, it'd be like the whole as if, world went to shit right after Slayer ended. Yeah, <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I noticed that. Maybe I mean, look, I know, I know you get asked this, and God knows Kerry gets asked it a lot. So I'm not going to ask it about. Do you think Slayer will come back or thereabouts? And who knows? I mean, who bloody knows what the answer to these questions is going to be? But, I I highly doubt it. Yeah, and you know what? I think that's a great thing. It's a bit like when the X-Files finished or when Seinfeld finished or Faith No More first broke up. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, to, to my knowledge, it'll never happen again. To my knowledge, you know, I don't know. At the same time, maybe someday someone just offers so much money that changes people's minds. But, you know, the band went out on a fucking super high note on top. And um, why sully that, you know? Mm. No, I agree. I totally agree. agree. I mean, we've already outlasted Motley Crue's retirement. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, theirs, theirs has gone a little longer because of the pandemic, but it took them, what, a year to decide they'd tour again? Well, I don't know how Vince can do it, given his current state, the poor bastard. Yeah, yeah. He needs to, like, he needs a trainer. Well, there might be some psycho... I'm not, hey, I don't know shit from Shinola, okay? Let me be clear. But there might be some other things going on there because how you can let yourself get to that point when you clearly got obligations with the Def Leppard tour and the like. Yeah, you clearly got obligations and huge obligations. Like, you know, I can only speak for myself. You know, if, if I had gotten that, like, let's say in 10 years Slayer says they want to do some shows and I've sat around here in the hills and just gotten really big. The first thing I'm going to do is hire a trainer and get my shit together. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe those royalty checks from, uh, from the early, I mean, I know they've done very well business wise. So maybe the royalty checks are just, they're coming in and there's not that incentive or there must be some incentive. Otherwise, why would they be out there? But it might not be too obvious. I, I think, I think personally the guy who likes to drink too much. So. That that seems to be apparent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not good. It's not good, I suppose. I mean, I think you've got to, as, a, as an artist, as a legacy artist, you have to respect your legacy. And if you're coming out and you, yeah, you're missing and no notes. No one expects Vince to look like he did in, you know, 1985, you know. But um, no. you should look like you're, like you're taking it seriously. Well, you look at Phil Collin from Def Leppard. No oh God, he's a freak of nature. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's and he's he's an awesome guy too. If you've had a chance to talk to he's him, very nice guy. I've met him twice. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you can do it, but I think it's just got to be something that comes from within you, like like with with yourself, mate. So so on that point, you've been playing music now for in terms of in the spotlight. I'm talking about for forty or forty five years or thereabouts. So bear with me here when I make a, a, a terrible joke, but you're damn close to making a career out of it. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> if you weren't a musician, what do you think you might have yeah. done with your career? I have no idea. I've never really given that much thought. I don't know, maybe a SWAT team officer. Mm. I could see you doing that. 
Yeah, joining the military, you think that might have been an option? No, I would have gone into if I'd never had started playing guitar and never started smoking weed and shit. I don't know. I always <laughs> like I, I, being like a SWAT team member was always glamorous as hell to me. A sniper guy hmm. up on the rooftop a mile away would have been awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a hell of a job, something like that, isn't it? You need to have a steady hand, no doubt. But look, yeah. You, actually, I wanted to mention this point around the Vince thing, but look, you mentioned recently that you gave up drinking, and I know a lot of us, we struggle with it. It's tough, man. Life is long, you know, the bottle of vodka sitting there when you get home from work or what have you, and before you know it, you're half a bottle deep. But, mate, for someone who's trying to give up drinking, what would you say? Um, you know, you just got to like do what's best for you. Like my problem wasn't hard alcohol. My problem wasn't being on the road. My problem was being stuck at home in a pandemic, you know, like, like a lot of people. Mm. And so, you know, I like beer. I'm a beer snob. And I went from like drinking a couple of beers, watching a football game, you know, like I used to, to drinking 14, 12% alcohol beers by myself, you know, and, um, God started affecting my moods. That was the most important thing. So yeah. Started, you know, I've, been, I've been partying since I'm 16. You know, I'm not missing anything anymore. Party continues sober. You know, I've found that I have just as much fun. When's the book coming out? Because you got a heck of a story. I, I've been offered several times, one of these days, maybe. I hope it happens. Uh, I know I know your career is far from over, but you you were one of the guys that was around when the Bay Area, the very genesis, if you like, and you're actually from the Bay Area. A lot of people move there, but you're from yeah. there. You grew up around there. So you'd have probably the most intriguing firsthand account of all of these bands that took over the world. I know where all the bodies are buried in, in the heavy metal. A lot of them. But, you know, if I tell everybody, then no one will tell me where the bodies are buried anymore. So. <laughs> There's plenty of bodies out there. I, I think one of the issues, I think, is the way uh, – God, I hope I can say this. <laughs> one of the issues is the way that after people die, they get deified and put on a on – a, on a, actually, I'll just check. Have we got enough time to have a conversation about this? Yeah, we, we got good? time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're good. I was just – I wasn't sure, so I was checking. But when people die or when bands break up, they tend to get deified and put on a pedestal. In, in your view, and I'm not going to mention, you can, you know who I'm talking about when I talk about these sorts of things, but do some people and do some bands, do they get put in a pedestal that you feel wouldn't have been there, given that you know these people and are friends with a lot of these people, that if people didn't die and if that opportunity to make a patron saint out of people came about? I think that's just human nature. I think everybody... When you lose someone close to you, puts them on a pedestal because that's how we'd like to remember people, um, and that's how we'd like to be remembered. You know, so I don't think it's a, a musician thing. I think it's just life. You know, you know, if someone loses a family member. You know, you you want to remember them for all the awesome shit and forget about, you know, the time your cousin stole your fucking car stereo or whatever. <laughs> Were there any bands from back then, like a Blind Illusion, that you thought could and should have made it bigger but didn't? Anvil Chorus. I haven't even heard Anvil of them. Course, There you go. Oh, Anvil Chorus ruled the Bay Area. I'm amazed you've heard of Blind Illusion and not Anvil Chorus, though, because Anvil Chorus, at least in the Bay Area and, you know, and that stuff were a thousand times bigger than Blind Illusion ever got. Mm. When we were first playing – Clubs, the old Waldorf, Amber Chorus ruled. They like dominated. They were like super melodic, prog rock before prog rock, before there was ever a dream theater, there was fucking Amber Chorus. And then every single person in the band was immensely talented, like best two guitar team, you know, in the Bay Area. And uh, they were just incredible. And I thought they were just going to be the biggest thing ever. I mean, I think some drugs with a couple of members got in the way. I'm, you know, still friends with him, Doug Piercy, you know, on guitar, you know, he's playing in Blind Illusion now. But they were like the best. First time I ever saw him, I was like, I'd never seen up close and personal, like two guitar harmony leads like that ever. Like super incredible stuff. Was it was it weird for you when you'd tour and you'd see all of these bands that you were friends with, but you'd go to Germany or parts of Scandinavia or even here in Australia and you'd see people wearing those band T-shirts? You're thinking, shit, 
they've blown up. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I mean, on my first tour ever in Europe in 85, I was selling shirts out in front of the hotel to fans because, you, know? <laughs> you know, they didn't have possessed shirts, but I did. And some guy offered me uh, some money for an overkill shirt I was wearing. And, you know, like, oh, you know, they offered me good money. And next thing you know, we brought our suitcases down to the lobby. Mm. <laughs> we were selling it shit. We we're like, we need drinking money. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of possessed, were you mates with Larry Lalonde at all? Yeah, yeah. It was awesome on the final Slayer tour, uh, you know, reuniting with Larry after a long time, yeah. you know, with Prime Primus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He's he's one of those guys that uh, I know him through Primus, and I've had a conversation with him about this, but uh, in the conversation about who the first death metal vocalist was or who inspired the that vocal style, and Jeff, Jeff insists that he did it, fair enough. But Larry is overlooked as having that quintessential death metal guitar style that then Chuck took. Um, was it? Did you find him, his playing back in the day when you were watching on, did you think it was a bit revolutionary? I didn't think it was revolutionary at the time. You know, um, looking back now, I absolutely think it does. You know, at the time, I didn't know that Jeff was inventing death metal vocals. And I'm on the, I'm on the team Becerra. I think he did. Mm -hmm. Some people say Chuck did. I think Jeff beat him time-wise by a little bit. And Larry certainly revolutionized a lot of that death metal style guitar playing. But at the time, we just thought it was a little bit different thrash metal, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you. Yeah. Did, did you guys tour with Venom back in the day? Yeah, twice. Epic. Best tours I ever did. Nice. Yeah. What Did you get to know Mantis very well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we hung out all the time, you know. You know, less with him, more with Cronus and uh, and Abaddon. You know, but um, he was a super nice guy, and uh, the tours were legendary for us. You know, we we're touring with our heroes. Yeah, Mantis, aka Jeff Dunn, is a nice fellow. I've got to say, I've had a conversation with him too a couple yeah, of years ago. Dude. But yeah, he very like yourself, mate. Very humble. Um, you know, especially for an originator of a genre, if you like. So, but that that leads to another point. Like for you, has there been? Uh, has there been a career highlight that you could single out and say, that's a moment when I really felt like I'd made it? I don't know. I don't think I've made it yet, <laughs> but that's what drives me and keeps me pushing harder and working harder, you know, like a chip on my shoulder. And if I don't have a chip, I'll look around for one to put there so I can knock it off. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I was selling out Madison square garden and uh, Wembley with Slayer was pretty epic. Yeah, those when, when you're approaching playing with Slayer, do you have to? And I ask this question of Eric Rutan, you know, if he's shift from Orbit Angel to Cannibal Corpse, or really from Hate Eternal into Cannibal Corpse. But did did you have to change your approach ever so slightly, or was it more or less the same approach? Slightly on the rhythm side of things, because uh, Slayer plays a little less muted than I do. You know, Exodus is all about super heavy palm muting. They pedal and on their notes a little bit more open, a little closer to the bridge than I do. And some of that's just due to the riffs. You kind of have to, you know. And um, but um, so I just tried to like play it the the way I thought they should be sounded sounding, and uh, some of the riffs made me play that way. But that's about it. Yeah. No. Fair enough. And and. I mean, you're an extremely capable guitarist, and I think you, uh, as I said, I meant what I said. I think that you're really the only person that could have stepped in and done done what you did, especially because of Repentless. So, again, I know you've you've been asked this question, or you may have been asked this question before, because Slayer comes up so often for you. But um, is Repentless? Did you have a lot to contribute with the album? Did Kerry ask for a lot of your contributions there? No, I just played leads on it. You know, I did all my tracks in one day. I went in and like, all right, you know, I'm ready to go home. Let's finish this. And uh, that was done. Back on an airplane the next day. Is that it? So just the one day in and out? Yeah, just one day. One day I was in there. Did you have demo tapes sent to you or, you know, MP3s or what have you, where you could sort of work some stuff? Yeah, a little bit of some of the stuff. Some of it I just heard and just, you know, let me see what sticks and just improvise everything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not so familiar with the album, to be honest with you, where I can pick the differences between the two solos yet, but I'm getting, I'm becoming more familiar with it, I've got to say. It's good walking music. I don't run these days. I tend to die whenever I run. So, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> I hear you. Mate, I'll, I'll make this my final question for you. 
any career challenges that you can speak to that, that you really feel have brought out your best? Challenges? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, well, right now, the last year has been about the most challenging ever, you know, cancer, you know, dealing with my own like elbow issues, which, you know, they, after we finished the album, I didn't play guitar for about, you know, several months, you know, I just couldn't. And, uh, so all of that shit was a challenge and, um, but, you know, it just strives us to keep working, you know, Exodus is a band that, you know, we're super committed and, uh, we're super goal oriented on kicking everybody in the fucking face (laughs) like and that's our job you know if you want some melodic sing-along ballad you know there's some great ones go someone else's show for that shit you don't come to access for that you come to like see some violence you know we're here to bring it you do bring it but you've always bought it really you're one of those bands where it's if you, what we do. <laughs> if you want fast, you know, this is not a dig at Mustaine, but he always used to say, if you want fast, heavy stuff, come out and see Megadeth. Wrong. It's Exodus. You guys have never yeah. taken your foot off the pedal. It's always been down on the accelerator no, pedal. Should, Fuck the if brake. You, if, if you measure BPMs, we're like 10 times faster than we used to be. <laughs> it's like <laughs> shit's getting crazy now. It is, it is. And, and and almost my final question, the last one, this will be it though, but uh, are we on your radar, Australia, in terms of touring and coming back down? I fucking hope so. I love playing there and it's been a long time for me with Exodus. You know, last time I was there was, was Slayer. So um, mm. I, I hope so. I hope we can bring the bass strikes back over there. That'd be amazing. Yeah, it'd be awesome. It'd be killer. Yeah. Well, that's it, mate. Thanks so much for making the music that you have. It is meaningful. Uh, we as heavy metal fans, some of us are sensitive. Some of us go through difficult things in life and we latch onto the music like a good friend. And I think your music is a very good example of that. And uh, you're a killer well, guitarist. You. You're a killer guitarist too, Gary. I hope people point that out like I've tried to in this chat here. Your contribution to it's, – it's not even about thrash metal, mate. It's the music in general. It's notable. It's important. Thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. Good luck with everything, mate, and hope to see you down here again soon. Yeah, for sure. Have a great day. Thanks, mate. No worries. Bye-bye. Catch you. I enjoyed that conversation with the thrash metal master blaster, Gary Holt. What a great fella. If you enjoyed that conversation and you'd like to listen to plenty more just like it, I have almost 600 episodes posted at scarsandguitars.com. I'm easy to find on social media, on Facebook and Instagram as well. If you could like, subscribe, share, and leave a nice comment, I'd appreciate it. You guys know I don't like asking for that sort of bullshit because it feels totally unnecessary, but if I don't ask, you don't know. So there you go. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now.